but we will continue and, um, and listen to Jill's, uh, Dr. Jill Kemp's talk. So please, um, if you can stay, please stay. If not, we will understand if you have to leave. But thank you very much for your patience. Dr. Bire and Mariam, welcome. Thank you, Dr. Makani. Thank you, everybody, for inviting me. Um, I, uh, I am living in Connecticut, um, one of the hardest hit states in the United States with COVID-19. Um, and I wanted to uh, uh, let you guys know today what we're doing um, uh, to try to maximize uh, the health and well-being of individuals living with sickle cell disease in the setting of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, next slide, please. So as many of you likely know, um, the global prevalence of sickle cell disease is vast. Uh, there are more than 300,000 estimated births um, uh, giving rise to an infant with uh, sickle cell disease annually. And the overwhelming majority of those births, almost 80% are in Sub-Saharan Africa. In fact, the projection is that 30 years from now, there'll be a 33% increase in the annual number of births and the representation of those births in Africa will, will increase to 85%. Next slide, please. So uh, we, we realize that individuals with sickle cell disease in many ways suffer from both acute exacerbations of their disease as well as the presence of chronic complications such as chronic organ damage over the lifetime. And having both acute and chronic manifestations of sickle cell disease require those persons living with it to have very close contact with the medical system, whether that be going to a doctor's office, uh, a, a nurse run clinic, a hospital or an emergency department for emergencies. But this close contact that's needed with the medical system is in direct conflict with the new strategy to try to mitigate the spread of COVID-19, which at least in the United States uh, and in many parts of Europe is a stay at home strategy. And I understand that that same message is being employed in many different regions in Africa now as well. As we know that the best way to try to prevent from getting COVID-19 in the first place is to have physical distancing distancing from individuals at least six feet away. So I list here on the left side some of the very um, common chronic complications individuals with sickle cell disease develop, and on the right side some of the acute complications that they develop and which prompt presentation to a hospital system. The most common of these are fever and the acute manifestation of sickle cell pain, but one complication that presents very acutely that has a very high mortality and morbidity is the acute chest syndrome. Next slide, please. So the acute chest syndrome is a, a term that's used for a constellation of signs and symptoms that individuals with sickle cell disease can present with. These uh, signs and symptoms include chest pain, cough, the presence of a fever, hypoxia or low oxygen levels, as well as oftentimes a new lung infiltrate on chest x-ray. Uh, people who have sickle cell disease and present with the acute chest syndrome are very high risk for intubation or the need for ventilator support, as well as high mortality. I will show you uh, the radiographs on the slide on the left is a chest x-ray of an individual with sickle cell disease who has the acute chest syndrome and you'll see the bilateral infiltrates. If you look on the right, this is a, an image, of, uh, an x-ray image of a recent paper published um, and this is a patient infected with COVID-19 that does not have sickle cell disease. And you'll see that the radiographic uh, appearances are very similar, as well as the signs and symptoms of COVID-19, which oftentimes present as cough, fever, shortness of breath, and low oxygen. So it's very hard to differentiate the acute chest syndrome from COVID-19 infection. Next slide, please. So, we're very concerned as um, healthcare providers of individuals living with sickle cell disease that the overlap of lung infection from COVID-19 together with the acute chest syndrome could result in heightened complications in individuals with sickle cell disease who get infected with COVID-19. And this may amplify the amount of utilization of healthcare um, facilities. Uh, whether that be hospitalizations or emergency departments. In fact, we're very concerned that COVID-19 infection alone could trigger 
the development of the acute chest syndrome, and that the combination of the two could have uh, excess morbidity and mortality for the patients. So I hope I've impressed upon you that COVID-19 infection in the setting of sickle cell disease poses a diagnostic challenge because the same individual could have both manifestations at the same time. Uh, it poses treatment challenges because the treatment of the acute chest syndrome is not the same as the treatment of COVID-19 infection. Uh, COVID-19 infection generally is supportive care and in many circumstances, they are trialing the use of hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin and some centers are using anti-IL-6 antibodies and other investigational strategies. But no COVID-19 infection is treated with a large red blood cell exchange transfusion, which is really the mainstay of treatment in addition to systemic antibiotics and oxygen support in individuals with the acute chest syndrome. Next paragraph, oh, sorry, next slide. So this is a, a map of the United States just to remind individuals that, you know, compared to Africa, we have a very small number of individuals living with sickle cell disease estimated to be at about 100,000. And we have about 2,000 births per year across the country. Um, this map shows you uh, the distribution and prevalence of sickle cell disease. Uh, those countries, sorry, those states that are darker red and, and rusty colored have a higher uh, number of individuals living with sickle cell disease. Uh, another issue that's important to, to note is that access to medical care for individuals with sickle cell disease is a major problem in the United States, especially among adults who, who have historically found it difficult to leave the pediatric clinics and find an adult medical provider who either has the expertise or interest in caring for them. Next slide, please. Here you will see again the distribution of sickle cell disease uh, prevalence on the left side map of the United States. And on the right, this is a map I took um, from the, the New York Times last week when we were having our initial webinar. And you'll see that this is the, um, the these red dots uh, show the um, prevalence of uh, COVID-19 infection across the United States. And what I find very interesting is that these maps are almost superimposable. So where there are a lot of individuals living with sickle cell disease, right now there's also high rates of COVID-19 infection. So this is a real issue for individuals living with sickle cell disease. Next slide, please. Another, another issue to highlight is that due to um, European migration out of Africa and the Middle East, um, both uh, sections of the world that, that have high numbers of individuals with sickle cell disease, that Europe has uh, seen an, a dramatic increase in the number of individuals in their country living with sickle cell disease. And as you also know from earlier talks, many of these European countries, including Italy, are in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. Next slide, please. So, so what are the actions that we're taking in the United States? Well, as, uh, as was uh, told to you, I'm the chief medical officer of the Sickle Cell Disease Association of America, which is the oldest and largest sickle cell disease advocacy organization in the United States. And as chief medical officer, I am also the chair of the Medical and Research Advisory Committee, which we call MARAC. MARAC is composed of 33 members. It's an international committee, although the majority of individuals uh, are based in the United States. We have um, committee members who are from Canada, Italy, the United Kingdom, Lebanon, Ghana, and Tanzania, including Dr. Julie Matani. Uh, MARAC uh, quickly uh, developed guidelines uh, to try to assist both persons living with sickle cell disease and their caregivers, as well as healthcare providers uh, to help um, them manage uh, individuals living with sickle cell disease in the current COVID-19 pandemic. These guidelines have regular uh, weekly updates um, and they are, they are uh, in repositories online and easily accessible globally. These guidelines lay the basis for very important awareness, education, advocacy, and philanthropic supports. Next slide, please. So this is an example of the first page of the patient and caregiver advisory. Uh, it, it is uh, very easy to understand and very easy language. Um, there's even a checklist that helps people be prepared in their homes um, to, to manage living with sickle cell disease. 
um, and tells people what to do and when to get care. The, the message that we're trying to get across to patients and families is at all costs, if you can try to manage people's disease and even the acute pain manifestations at home, to please try to do so with close telephone contact with your healthcare provider. In the United States, uh, the delivery of healthcare has historically been face-to-face -face interactions between patients and physicians, um, but there have been uh, overwhelming sweeping changes to the healthcare system in the setting of the COVID-19 pandemic to increase the utilization of telephone visits to try to limit um, the, the, the number of times uh, people need to leave their homes just to get routine care. Um, so that's a highlight here. We're also uh, advising that, that persons wear masks when they leave their home, even if they have to be homemade masks. Um, and we give uh, gentle advice um, concerning continuing your chronic medications and also continuing blood transfusions if you're on a blood transfusion program. Um, we're also translating uh, this patient and caregiver advisory into Arabic, French, and Spanish. We've had a lot of requests for these translations. Um, we are all, next uh, slide, please. We realize as the Medical and Research Advisory Committee that we couldn't be making recommendations to patients and families if we did not give uh, companion uh, uh, recommendations to healthcare providers. So if we're asking patients to manage their disease at home, one of the most important things we needed to be able to do is have patients um, have access to needed medications at home. So we have asked, uh, for example, healthcare providers to call in medications over the telephone to pharmacies and to preferentially use pharmacies that deliver medications directly to the patient's homes. Um, so this is the, just the first page of about a five or six page regularly updated healthcare provider advisory. Next slide, please. We are also uh, cognizant that um, living with a chronic medical condition that in and of itself has a lot of stigma um, and there's a lot of uh, comorbid uh, mental health conditions, including anxiety and depression that individuals with sickle cell disease often live with. Um, that in this setting, uh, asking people to self-isolate and have physical distancing um, can, can impair the capacity to sort of maintain um, uh, an ideal level of mental health. So we are also uh, developing infographics and other resources to help individuals with sickle cell disease maintain a high level of em emotional well-being as they adjust to living in the COVID-19 pandemic. Next slide, please. So we also at the Sickle Cell Disease Association of America have um, uh, taken as a primary focus the need to help with blood donations. So uh, in the US, uh, since the COVID-19 pandemic uh, started, there has been a dramatic decrease in the number of blood donors, as well as organized blood donor drives. Uh, this uh, has uh, led to some uh, existing shortages of blood and um, the expectation of future shortages of blood in other communities across the United States. And as many of you know, uh, a significant proportion of individuals with sickle cell disease rely on regular blood transfusions to prevent complications that include stroke. So at the Sickle Cell Disease Association of America, we have taken uh, multidisciplinary measures to try to increase blood donations. We have asked patients and families to try to, um, to get their uh, younger and healthier family members to consider leaving the home uh, to, to donate blood. We have assured them that blood uh, centers have changed the way that they run their operations to, to respect the uh, physical distancing rules uh, and that the likelihood that these individuals would get COVID-19 infection uh, by simply going to a blood donation center is extremely low. We have also re-educated our community to remind them that people who have sickle cell trait are eligible to donate blood. There is a big uh, misconception and myth that if you have sickle cell trait that you'll be turned away. In the United States, that's not true. Although that blood would not preferentially go to an individual with sickle cell disease, it is perfectly good blood and can be utilized in other populations. I think that, I think that might be my last slide.
Thank you very much, Dr. Burez. Thank you very much, Dr. Andy Mariam. This was really, really very helpful. And for a lot of the people who work on sickle cell